So all of us in all of our lives, there's different seasons in life. When you put it all together, it makes an amazing story. I remember when I was growing up, my beloved grandma, she used to always call us all of our names at the same time. So like you'd be walking by, she'd be like, hey, Trisha, Jody, Daniel. And, and, I, and I remember just being like, grandma, you know that my name is not the name of me and my sisters. And she'd say, oh, Danny, I'm old. I can't remember your name, you know, but I know who you are. And I used to laugh. And no, listen, don't anyone get the funky idea that you can call me Danny either. My grandma can call me Danny. And if you have a cannoli, you can call me Danny. But other than that, it's not my name. And my, of course, my bride can call me Danny whenever she wants to. But I used to always laugh because, like, my grandma literally would call you all the names. She just, like, kind of run down the list of the names. And it's funny because I used to think to myself, well, you know, when she said, well, I'm old, so I can call you whatever I want, I'm like, well, okay, you know, I'm not going to mess with that, grandma. But then, sure enough, I'm 45 years old, and I see my kids, and I, I know who they are, but I can't remember their names. So I just call them you. <laughs> hey, you. Hey, you, you know, and, and also my kids' names are Obadiah, Maranoth, and Annabelle. So if I try and say all those names, I'll just pass out, you know, <laughs> nice long names. But, but it's funny now, because like at, as, at 45 years old, like you realize like grandma wasn't, you know, wasn't so far off that sometimes like my, the recall isn't as fast as it used to be, you know, and I never thought I'd really make it to 45. I figured if Jesus got 33 years Every moment after 33, I'm on bar of time. But, but it's amazing how when I was younger, I never would have thought like, oh yeah, like I'm not gonna have the fast recall. Now I know some of you right now are saying, Fusco, you're 45, you're like a baby. Like you don't even realize what's coming next, <laughs> you know? I was talking to somebody about that just recently and I was like, man, I'm 45, man, the body's changed. And he's like, wait till you're 65, dude. Like what do you, how do you think this is gonna go for you? And I started laughing. And, but, but what's amazing is, is that in each season of our life, there's new things that are happening. And it's such an important thing for us to realize that life has different seasons and each season is essential and important to the work that God wants to do. And I think one of the keys is, is to try and make sure you don't fall into that, the glory days mentality. How many of you remember that song by Bruce Springsteen? It's a classic. He's from New Jersey. We call him the boss because that was his nickname. But if you don't know Bruce Springsteen, glory days, it's got a classic guitar riff. And it's, but it's the whole idea of looking back to a time and saying, it was wonderful when. Right, And so you have this, this thought in your mind. Now, don't get me wrong. There are, will always be times in our lives that we look back on in great, with great fondness. But really, for the child of God, we should be able to embrace each season of life, whatever it brings with it, and see the hand of God in the midst of all of it. So yeah, there might be times like, man, that was really special when that happened. And that, man, that was a powerful moment. But really what it boils down to is that we realize that Jesus is real and God is at work. And in each moment of our lives, God is doing something. And I think the big mistake we can make is thinking that God was really moving in a time past and then you judge everything against that. Because how God moved in one season is not necessarily how he wants to move in another season. But the beauty is, is the... The testimony of God moving in your past also gives you hope in the present and for the future because you've seen how God has already moved and you start saying to yourself, okay, because of all these things that God has done, now I trust that God's gonna do something fresh. And so for each one of us, I like to tell people that a testimony is your story when God is the center of it. That's what a testimony is. It's when you have a story, but you let God be the center of it. And in a lot of ways, that is kind of a, a foreign concept to our culture because our culture believes very much in you and your story, but it really believes that you should be the center of your story. And all through the scriptures, what you find is that the people of God let who the Lord is kind of define their entire story. And I bring that up because we're, we're doing this series in the book of Nehemiah that we're calling Honest, and it's about the, the restoration of Israel through the ministry of Nehemiah. And we're gonna see today a, a prayer that is very, 
normal and almost, uh, it's, it, it's a type of a prayer where they go through their story again. And you find this all through the scriptures where they rehearse their story. But we're gonna constantly see God as the centerpiece of that story. And we're gonna talk about it together. So to get into this today, I want you to open up your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter nine, Nehemiah chapter nine. So if you brought your Bible with you, I always encourage you to bring your Bible to church, mostly because it's the only place someone will encourage you to bring your Bible. So, uh, so, so bring your Bible to church with you. If you didn't, I realize your, your phones are smart, potentially, you know, uh, and they, you know, maybe you have a tablet with you. We just want you to be able to read along with the word of God. And so Nehemiah, if you have a, a, an actual Bible, it's between the book of Ezra and Esther there in about the first quarter of your Bible and what we call the Old Testament. Chapter nine is still between uh, chapters eight and 10. Um, at some point, they're gonna tell us that that's not correct and we'll deal with it together. I don't know how it will work at that point, but for now, it still sits there as it always has. Now, before we get into this chapter and see this prayer, I've been making the point that the book of Nehemiah breaks up into two sections. The first seven chapters, the focus is on rebuilding the walls, and then the final like six chapters is about restoring or rebuilding the people. And I've been making the case that it was essential to rebuild the wall first because the only way you can rebuild the people is if you take away their most basic feelings of fear and insecurity. So they were most vulnerable because the walls were broken down. So if Nehemiah would have just gotten there and be like, man, we're gonna read the word of God with the walls being broken down, there was this feeling of, man, this is bad. Like we are vulnerable here. And so we always have to remember that given people's journeys in life, we have to actually help assuage their vulnerabilities so that they can hear the word of God. Does that make sense? So you have to take care of the first things first. And so, but what's beautiful is once the walls get built, so much of the restoring of the people of God has its foundation not only because they're reading the word of God, but also for the fact that they are letting the word of God impact their hearts in a very personal way. And as I've been studying this and as I've been preparing for this message, that has been my prayer for us as the Crossroads family. My prayer is that not only do you hear the word of God, not only in this message, but as you read it day in and day out, but you actually say, Lord, open up my heart to receive you in your word. Lord, speak to me personally in my circumstances that I'm going through right now. Lord, because you know what it's like to hear the word but not really be listening, right? Or you know what it's like to be like, man, the word, I, I have the word and, and, and I'm thinking, but I'm not really letting it impact my life so that now I'm responding to the word. We always say we want to simply respond to Jesus. And, and so my hope is, is that as we hear this today and as we study it, that you start saying to yourself, I wanna to respond to the word of God. What does this mean for me today? Because that's what they were doing back in this moment in the life of the children, but they're hearing the word of God and it's literally wrecking their hearts like in the right, in, in all the best ways of getting wrecked. Like it's changing them. And because it's changing them, they're moving in a different direction than they had been moving in before. So together, we're gonna read Nehemiah chapter nine, verses one to 21. Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one fourth of the day. And for another fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Then Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabnia, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it. 
the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites. To give it to his descendants, you have performed your words, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them, so you made a name for yourself, as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and their persecutors you threw into the deep, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire, to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst, and told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. Even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you up out of Egypt, and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. It's a powerful section of scripture, isn't it? I mean, so right at the beginning of chapter nine, we realize that this restoring of the community took place in, in the first month of their, their calendar. And so in the previous chapter, we had seen that they were hearing the, the word on the first day, and then they realized that, of course, the Feast of Tabernacles was coming. So let, let's celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which was from the 15th to the 22nd of the month. Now it's simply just two days later now, and we find that the children of Israel are now assembled together again with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. So there's no doubt that between them hearing the law and then celebrating the feasts of booths or tabernacles together, now two days later, they're choosing to fast again and, and, there's, and the word of God is impacting them in such a way that they're showing up with these external signs of humility. Sackcloth was not like the new Gucci shorts that they used to wear or something. It's like they, they were actually designed to be uncomfortable, right? And so the idea is I'm putting on the least comfortable clothes and, and not like, like it was literally painful and itchy to wear them. And they would throw dust on their head. These are all external signs of humility before God and they're fasting. So they're not eating. So the people are seeking God in a very, very powerful way. And they're, and they're separating themselves from people who are, weren't part of their community. And they begin to confess their sins. And they begin to, not only their own sins, but their historical sins. And it's amazing. Look at verse 3. And they stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day. And for another fourth, they confessed and worship the Lord their God. So what that means is they studied the word for six hours. So we're gonna have a long service today. <laughs> you, guys, you, got, you guys buckled in? And, and not only are we gonna have a six hour sermon, and you know I'm ready for this, I've been waiting for this forever, but then we're gonna have another six hours of worship and confession. We're gonna have a 12 hour gathering. Now you know what's amazing is though, 
I realized that if we had 12 hour worship gatherings, Crossroads would go from being one of the largest churches in our community to being the smallest church in our community. But it's kind of sad, isn't it? Because you know when God's at work, we have this insatiable appetite for the word. We have this driving desire to worship. We, We so much want to be right with God. And you see that in them. No one's making them do this. God is just moving in such a way that now they're spending the entire day in the word and in worship as a community. And then this prayer begins. And really, it's this prayer of the Levites over the people. And what's really beautiful is they're saying, listen, God, we praise you. God, we bless you. God, you're glorious and you're exalted. And then what they do is they, they, they start with creation about how God created everything. Verse six, you know, you alone are the Lord. You have made heavens, the heavens of the heavens and all their hosts. You made all the stars, God. The earth and everything in it, the seas and all that's in it, and you preserve them all, and all the hosts of heaven worship you. How cool is that? Every time we have a clear night and you look up at that night sky, all those stars are shining their light, praising God. It makes astronomy so much cooler than how cool it already is. Because everything that exists, exists to God's glory. But then they begin this rehearsal of the story of the children of Israel. And I would like to say it to you this way. My friends, you and I, we should never forget where you've been. Because the children of Israel never forgot where they were. It begins, they start talking about God calling Abraham. He called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. He made a covenant with him, a covenant to give him the land. Then you fast forward, that's the book of Genesis. And then they start talking about, and you saw our affliction in Egypt. So now it fast forwards to the book of Exodus and how God delivered them with a mighty hand from Egypt and parted the Red Sea and they walked on through, but the people were persecuting them. They got swallowed up by the waters and then they ended up in the wilderness, right? And how God provided for them with the pillar of cloud by day. Back in the day in the desert, you were happy for the pillar of cloud in the middle of the day, that hot desert sun. And then the pillar of fire by night in a world before flashlights and lights on your phone and street lights, it would be really scary. You didn't know what was around you. So that pillar of fire by night. Oh yeah. And then God fed them food manna brought water out of rocks over and over again in your bibles you will read this continual retelling of the story of the children of israel and what's amazing so much about the story is the story is not with them at the center it's a story of this is all that god has done it's the story of god in their own life You know, and and I really hope that for each one of us, when we tell the synopsis of the story of our lives, God would be the center of that story. I want all of you to have that testimony. Not where you're the center of your story, but you see God's redemption at the center of your story. Because that is the true testimony of your life. God at the center what God has done, what God is doing. And it's amazing how many times in the Bible they go over this stuff again. Like they're praying, they're telling God their story that God was in the middle of. But it's this never forgetting where you've been. And it's important to remember that we're nev- we should never forget where we've been, but it's also not a request to stay where you've always been. You have to remember where you've come from, but you're not supposed to live in your past. Listen to what it says in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. The prophet says this, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So he says, don't remember the former things. He's not saying, for, he's not saying forget where you've been. He's saying, don't live there because I want to do something fresh. 
And I think this is so important because remember we talked about the glory days kind of mentality? I think it's very easy for us spiritually to look back on a time in our life and say that was when God was really moving. And I'm here to tell you, I bet God was moving there, but I'm quite sure that he's moving today right where you are. But it looks different than it used to look. There was different variables. I mean, they saw the children, the children of Israel saw God's mighty hand with those plagues because they were enslaved in Egypt. So like those circumstances dictated God to do something differently than what God did at different times in their history. And the greatest mistake we can make is to impose what God did at another time on this moment and, and be like, oh, there must be something. We're missing out. Because God is always working no matter what the circumstances are. And I, I think this whole idea of letting God be the centerpiece of our story is might even be more important right now in the culture in which we live because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, how our culture is really struggling to understand how do we see ourselves, our identity. And our culture has all these different identities that it kind of peddles. So like, you know, there's the identity that's become so uh, commonplace in our culture where I look inside my heart and I tell you who I believe that I am. Right, which is very challenging because you'll look into your heart at a different stage of your life and who you believe that you are will be completely different than what it was when you were 12 and what it was when you were 17 and what it was when you were 25. How many of you see yourself a lot differently than you did when you were a teenager? Go to all of you, raise your hands. The teenagers are like, totally, man. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, and so, so that idea of I define myself based on what I look in my heart, what I think I see in there, that's, that's shifting sand. What you also have in our day and age today is the overriding way people identify themselves now today is as a victim. Like there have been some people, philosophers have started to write it, but they, they call it the victimocracy of America. Everyone is a victim. Now, I don't ever want to minimize somebody's pain. And I realize I've never walked in anyone else's shoes except myself. But here's the deal. Our cult, like in a culture where everyone is a victim, unless you find a way to see yourself as a victim, you feel left out. And FOMO, the fear of missing out, is a real issue for people today. So everybody wants to see themselves as a victim today. But I'm talking to you as a pastor, and I'm talking to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, your Bible says that you're more than a conqueror. So the whole I identify myself as a victim has no business in the kingdom of God. Yes. You may have gone through horrific things, but God is the great God of redemption even in the midst of tremendous tragedy. And when we allow God to be the center of the story, that testimony, not with us as the center, but with God as the center, you begin to realize that the testimony that God gives us is that, yes, all these things went wrong, but my God, the God of the scriptures, has redeemed all these things, and now we see him working in and through the things that were the most painful. If there was ever a human being who could claim to be a victim, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the only person who never sinned yet was condemned for the sins of the entire world. But Jesus is more than a conqueror. Jesus bears those scars for eternity. But yet, but yet, doesn't see himself as a victim. And so I want to encourage you. I realize so many people have gone through such challenging times. But I believe that God wants to do a work of redeeming even those parts. And I realize that it's not that God's work of redemption takes time. Sometimes us coming to terms with how God can redeem it takes time. And as I've been studying this and preparing this, my prayer for the Crossroads family, for each one of you, is that you would give God the necessary room in your life to bring redemption to those areas where you feel the most pain. Because I believe in the God of redemption. And I believe that God can 
redeem the hardest and most horrendous parts of our story and he can write a testimony in the midst of it that is beautiful, that is glorious, and that is life-giving. And I believe that's one of the things that he wants to do in each one of us. Now, we're gonna read more now in Nehemiah chapter nine. So let's read verses 22 to 31 together. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go in and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land that they might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and a rich land and possessed houses full of all goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself. And they worked great provocations. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they again did evil before you. Therefore, you left them in the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven and many times you delivered them according to your mercies and testified against them, that you might bring them back to your law. Yet they acted proudly and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffened their necks and would not hear. Yet for many years you had patience with them and testified against them by your spirit and your prophets. Yet they would not listen. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for you are God, gracious and merciful. So as they continue telling their story, you notice now as they move from that initial wilderness wandering, now the story is to them getting into the promised land. You remember the story with Joshua. Right, where now all of a sudden God brings them into this land that he had promised to them in the time of Abraham. But once they get in the land, you know, you would think to yourself, man, once the children of Israel are in the land, God has blessed them. Man, they're just gonna be so right on with the Lord. But is that the story? No, unfortunately it's not. But this teaches us something that I think is so important. And this prayer is really teasing it out for us. And it's a simple idea but it's really important is that God is faithful even when we are not. And that is the testimony. It's like the children of Israel had everything going for them, but yet they were unable to be faithful. But just because they were faithless, God was still faithful. You know, it's amazing because they walk into the promised land and, and, and God, I, 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 I read it and it makes me laugh because they're in the promised land and everything is going great. I mean, look at verse, they come on in, they have strong cities, it's a rich land, they have these houses full of all these goods, they have cisterns already dug, so there's water that's in abundance there. It says that there's vineyards and olive groves there's fruit trees in abundance. And then it says, end of verse 25, so they ate and were filled and they grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. They were blessed. I always think about that. I'm all Italian, so that means that when you're, when you're, when you're heavy, it means you're happy. I remember when Lynn and I got married, right? Oh, we got married and, and it was the first time in my life that, you know, um, I had someone else to, to eat with and I remember Lynn would just make me these huge meals and when I saw my grandma, I told you about my grandma earlier, we, we saw my grandma, my grandma looked at me, she looked at my little, my, my, my little belly that had grown and she's looked, went right to Lynn, oh, my daddy's so happy, 
kids. She was, you know, and, I, and it's so funny. It's like, literally, you're like, man, if, if you're happy, you're happy, you get bigger. And it's so funny. It's right here in the Bible. I never saw that before, you know? But, but it's like, but what's so funny is it's like they're, soup, they're blessed, but then notice verse 26, nevertheless, they were disobedient and they were rebelled against you. They cast your law behind their back. See, it's the problem of when you're blessed is that sometimes when you're blessed, you take your eyes off of the real prize, which is the Lord. We get our eyes on the abundance and all the things that are happening. And it happens so easily. It's why people get saved when they're at rock bottom, but when everything's going great, they don't need the Lord. It's like people like, and I've seen this. People are broken by life and they come to Jesus and then Jesus does all the things they're hoping for, restores the relationships, fixes the finances, and then before you know it, you don't see them for a while. Because then they get, God has done all this stuff and then they don't need God in the same way in their mind, but they do because sure enough, that cycle continues and then they lose things and then, oh, I gotta get back to the Lord. And it's like, it's this vicious cycle, but it really just shows our faithlessness. And of course, I'm reminded of the fact that it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, that if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And my friends, this is the good news of the gospel. The gospel is not that we are faithful. The gospel is that God is faithful. The good news of Jesus is not that we get it all right because we never do. The truth of the gospel is that we get things wrong, but Jesus got everything right. The good news of being a follower of Jesus is that if I would have died on a Roman cross, I would have stayed dead. But Jesus, death had to give him back because he was undeserving of death. And our hope as followers of Jesus is not in our performance. It is in the finished work of Jesus. Now, that does not give us a license to be faithless. That's not saying, okay, because God is faithful and you're not, then be faithful. No, we should seek after faithfulness. But the reality is, is that all of us sin and fail. And our culture has such a strong performance mentality like, even recently, I was talking with my son Obadiah, and, and we were, and he was, you know, he's like, man, I really just want to be a, a good Christian. And I started laughing. I'm like, there's no such thing. Because there really isn't. There's just a good Savior and all the rest of us who need him. Now, I knew what he meant by it. He was, you know, talking about his own growth and the things that God wants to do in his life. And we should seek to be growing, but really the good news is not that you are doing better than you used to do. The good news is that Jesus has always been the same and he's perfect. And we wanna really grab hold of that because I think we forget sometimes how much we need Jesus. You know, I was thinking about this idea of, you know, God is faithful even when we're not. And I always think about that happening in the life of the apostle Peter, you know? Because the Apostle Peter, you know, he, he thought he was big stuff in the kingdom, you know? And I remember, you know, Jesus was like, Peter's like, even if everybody forsakes you, Jesus, I won't. And Jesus is like, actually, before the sun comes up tomorrow, you're gonna deny me three times. And then he says, Jesus says, and when you return to me, then strengthen your brothers. So you realize that Jesus to Peter prophesies his forsaking of Jesus The fact that he's gonna pretend like he doesn't even know Jesus and that he is gonna come back and then God wants to restore him and he wants him to build up the brethren. And sure enough, Peter's like, no way, Lord, man, forget you. What do you think? He's like, yeah, he knows your heart, Peter, right? And Peter, sure enough, he denied Jesus. And then when Jesus is resurrected, he sees Mary Magdalene, he's like, go tell the apostles and Peter too that I'm gonna go before them in Galilee. It's just so cool. And, like, and you just imagine Peter in all of his feelings of zealousness and, and passion. I will never forsake the Lord. And then he totally does. And Jesus is like, well, guess what, buddy? I'm still faithful even though you're not. And I believe that for us, we need to really grab hold of the reality that it's not your relationship with God is not dependent on how good you did today. 
Some of us think that way, man. Like, God, man, I was in the Word for so long today. God must be really, he must really, really love me. It's like, yeah, he loves you just like the next person. He can't love you more and he won't love you less. Now, don't get me wrong. If you read the Word, you'll know that God loves you because it's in the Word. But God doesn't love you more based on your performance. But don't we have a tendency to think that way? And because God is faithful, even when we're faithless, I just really felt that there are some, maybe you're here in our sanctuary right now, maybe you're online right now, maybe you're watching this on the TV, on a radio, you're picking this up on some app somewhere, that you haven't come to Jesus because you think you just screwed up too bad. And what I wanna tell you is that is a lie because there is no mistake, no lifetime of mistakes that a person can make that is more powerful than the finished work of Jesus. The death of Jesus can forgive all sins. Yes, you've been faithless. Yes, you've made mistakes. Yes, there's consequences for that. But the only unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus. That's the only one. That's why you know Even though we're faithless, God is so faithful. And it is amazing when you look at this text that like, you know, he gets into the book of Judges. They're praying through, and this kind of cycle of God delivers, the people fall away, oppression hits, they cry out to the Lord, God delivers them, then they fall away, then oppression hits, and they cry out to the Lord, and God delivers them. The, the book of Judges runs in that kind of cyclical pattern. And unfortunately, many of our lives run in that same cyclical pattern, right? Where it's like, you start falling away from the Lord, all sorts of issues come up, and then you come back to the Lord, and God delivers. And if you find yourself, that's a, that's a crazy cycle to be on. The key is, is that when God delivers, stick with him. Stay with him. You don't need to be living a cycle like that. Just come to him and stay with him. Let him do all that he wants to do. And I love so much how it keeps coming back to the reality of God's character. Over and over again, God's character. The people are disobedient. They're rebellious. They're making mistakes. But God, but God. Now, as we move to this last section here in Nehemiah chapter nine, they're gonna move from the story of the past to their request for the present. So let's read together Nehemiah chapter nine, verses 32 to 38. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and awesome God who keeps covenant and mercy, Do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us, our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers and on all your people, from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. However, you are just in all that has befallen us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies with which you testified against them, For they have not served you in their kingdom, or in the many good things that you gave them, or in the large and rich land which you set before them, nor did they turn from their wicked works. Here we are, servants today, and the land that you gave to our fathers, to eat its fruit and its bounty. Here we are, servants in it, and it yields much increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. So now in this last part of this prayer, they they really have one important request. And I think it's one that we should all be praying. And it's really, they're really asking to make room for God to move. We need to make room for God to move because what's going on here is they realize that the the walls have been built, right? And now they're hearing the word of God, 
but they realize that they still have all sorts of issues. But in verse 32, it reminds them that there's all this trouble from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. Now, if you remember the history of the children of Israel, the two, 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes, they split after King Solomon. And the 10 northern tribes went into Assyrian exile. And then about 120 years later, the two southern tribes went into Babylonian exile. And even though now they're back in Jerusalem and the walls have been built, they are still under Medo-Persian rule. They are still being oppressed. And really what they're saying is, God, you've done so much. And they don't blame God for where they are. They're like, our own sin has created this scenario. But they're saying, God, will you do a work? And they're really simply praying, God, will you make some room so that you can move in this? And I think that that is a very powerful prayer for us. When was the last time you woke up and said, God, will you make room in my day today for you to move? Maybe your marriage is struggling. When was the last time you prayed, Lord, can we make some room in our marriage for you to do a fresh work? Maybe it's with your finances. It's all beat up, busted up. What does it look like? Lord, can you make some space here to do a work? Maybe it's at your job. Well, you know you're supposed to be there, but you just don't like, whatever it is. Lord, Lord, can you make some space here? for you to do the work that you want to do. See, it really is boiling down to then your ability to say, God, I believe that you want to do a work of redemption, but not only what you've done in the past, but what you want to do right now. And in a lot of ways, for all of us, the way God has moved in your past gives you hope that he can move in the present circumstances. When you look back over your life and you see the faithfulness of God, even when you were faithless, when you look back and you see this is all that God has done in the midst of all these other things, and you're looking at what's happening right now, because of what God has done in the past, you could say, oh, Lord, you could do something right now. And in a lot of ways, it's my hope for all of us that you are the kind of people who believe that God wants to do a work in the present. God wants to do a work in this present trouble, in the things that we're going through right now, in the specific areas where you're like, I do not know how this is gonna work out. Listen, you gotta say, Lord, make some space in my heart to trust you. Make some space in this circumstance for you to do something powerful. And I think when we do that, now all of a sudden we begin to look at all of our circumstances, not as things that are horrible, but as amazing opportunities for God to do a work. And then all of a sudden we're experiencing all that we're experiencing with a great hopefulness, almost an expectancy of God doing his work. Where are you lacking expectancy right now? Right, that, wherever that is, or you're like, man, man, this thing, where, where are you feeling hopeless? Where are you looking at a situation like, this is all bad? Now, I know you guys love Jesus, but we all get that way about certain things, don't we? Like, this is never, this is never gonna work, right? That's exactly where God wants you to make room for him to work. Right there, at the place where you're like, it's impossible. It'll never happen. That's the place that God wants to move. But we have to make some room. It's funny, I, I've been thinking of so much about this over the last number of months because, you know, in 2020, we talked about a year of renewal and how we wanted to be with Jesus. And then, like, everything got shut down. And I started laughing. I'm like, Lord, I didn't mean like that, you know? <laughs> Not that I have all that pull, but I'm like, but it was amazing how such a great opportunity was just kind of rejected by so many people. People were just angry. And I'm like, wait a second, like, what if we just make room for God to do a work? What if we just take this as God's grace in our lives? A chance for families to reconnect. 
a, you know, a, a chance for God to do fresh things. And I'll be honest, as, as we move through 2020, I had to fight to keep that perspective at times, especially as there's so much kind of conflict and everything. But what I think God wanted to teach me personally is that any time I divorce the work that God wants to do from any situation, I actually miss out on exactly what's happening in the situation. So brothers and sisters, I don't want you to miss anything that God's up to in your life. I don't want you to look at anything divorced from who the Lord is and what he's doing. The children of Israel fought to keep God at the center of their present issues. And I wanna encourage you to as well. God wants and is moving. It's just a question, do we have ears to hear and eyes to see? Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together. Father, I wanna thank you so much for this beautiful prayer. Lord, as we see the rehearsal of the history of the children of Israel, they look back and they see their faithlessness and your faithfulness. They don't want to forget where they've been. They don't want to forget the promises that you've made and the ways that they've stumbled and fumbled along the road. But Lord, as the, that restoration community there with Nehemiah, as they're standing there hearing your law and they are aware that although their walls are built, there's still so many issues they're just saying, Lord, do a work. Make some space, Lord, for you to work in the middle of this. And God, I just I wanna pray that over my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, where they're hopeless, where they feel beat down, where they feel defeated, where there's things that feel impossible, where there's only darkness, I ask, Lord, that you would just make a little space in their hearts for hope, for life. That, Father, by your spirit, you would shine the light of your countenance into the darkness that they feel. Father, we ask that you would give us a vision to make room for you to do the work you want to do. And Lord, we want to see your redemption in the entirety of our lives, not just in certain places. So God, do your work. And I want to thank you, God, that you are faithful God, I wanna thank you that you are not finished with any of us yet. Lord, I wanna thank you that we are all in the middle chapters. And Lord, we know that the story will end with your glory and us in your presence. And God, I ask that you would strengthen what is weak right now and that you would do the work that you want to do in each one of our lives. Now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I believe that there are a number of you who are here today who have never before put your faith and trust in Jesus and you're hearing this message and maybe you just think, man, I've made too many mistakes. God could never love me. God would never forgive me. God would never have me in his family. But you're hearing this message that even when we're faithless, he is faithful. Even when everyone else is faithless, he is faithful. Jesus wants you to be saved. He wants you to know that you are forgiven in him. He wants to do a work of renewal and restoration in you. He wants to make you white as snow. But you have to say yes to him. You have to receive the grace of God that comes through the finished work of Jesus. And if you're here today and you've never before put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. 
Maybe also you're here today and you're here just, maybe you're online, maybe you're here in our sanctuary, maybe you're watching this on TV or, or wherever you are, and, and maybe like that young son in the story, you've said yes to Jesus, but you've been away from the Father. You got caught up in whatever you got caught up in, distracted by life. But like that son who's called the prodigal son, and along the way you're like, man, I just need to go home. But he was worried that the father wouldn't accept him when he came back. He wouldn't even let him come back as a son. When he finds his way back to the house, the father's just so happy the son is home. And I believe there might be many of you here today that you've said yes to Jesus, but you've been far from him. And you're hearing this message and you're like, man, I need to, I need to come home today. I need, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. If that's you today, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity in just a moment to, to recommit your life to Jesus. I'm here to tell you the Father wants you home. You've always been his child. You may not feel like that right now, but he has never taken his eyes off of you. So if now you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time, or for the first time in a long time, I'm just gonna ask you to take a simple step a faith of me today. Because coming to Jesus is simple. You just turn, just give him your heart. So if that's you, and if you're giving him your heart today for the first time or after some time away, I just want you to raise your hand right where you are. Just say, it's me. I'm saying yes to Jesus here. Oh, God bless you. I see you right in the center of the sanctuary. Praise God. Oh, I see you right over there as well. Praise God with your hand up. Keep those hands up high. Just say, it's me. It's a large room. So raise those hands up high. Just say, it's me. I'm coming to Jesus. I'm coming home today. Just put those hands up high. I don't want anybody else here today. Anyone in their sanctuary? I want to draw people home to you. Oh, I see you also right there in the center of the sanctuary. Praise God. If you're, in, if you're online right now, if you have your hand up and you're in front of your computer, praise God. Just put that hand up. You're saying, I'm coming home today. Now, for those of you with your hands raised, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, oh, God bless you, I see you as well. Praise God, right there in the center of the sanctuary. We're gonna pray a prayer. Now, the whole church is gonna pray this prayer because we believe it too. But for some of you, maybe you're praying it for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. So everyone just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you. Your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And all the Crossroads family celebrated together as we said, amen and amen. Let's give these folks a round of applause.